I want to give Carrie Ruhlman a chance to introduce herself. She's been a big part of this since the since the beginning. Carrie, you want to just say hi real quick? I think we're on mute. Sorry, muted. <laughs> no problem. Uh, my name is Carrie Ruhlman. I'm a senior policy analyst and the director of the Office of Conservation Policy and Analysis for the commission. Um, my group does rulemaking, um, all public facing policy, and social science. Great. Thanks, Gary. And then, uh, Brett and Brad, you guys have been talking a lot already, but you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Hi, Brett Boston, and uh, Brent and I will be guiding you through. We've been working with the commission for quite a, quite a few years. Um, we're basically do a lot of natural resource mediation. So looking forward to this session, I think it's going to be great. And we got a great group of diverse folks to help us through the, the day. So thanks, Fern. Yeah, good morning. Uh, had a chance to talk with most all of you in, in advance of this. So today's the big day. You get to weigh in and, and uh, tell us about your thoughts and, and, and really help us shape what this is going to look like moving forward. So thanks for making time and being generous with your time, sharing some of your thoughts with us. Thanks all. And then I do want to note that there are a number of other folks from the WRC team on the call. Uh, these folks come from various positions throughout the state, but in one way, shape or form, are gonna have a piece of this process, have been a part of this process since the beginning. But these are the folks who again are kind of on the ground, supervising the, the work getting done or conducting the work itself. And uh, they'll be here to answer specific questions as they come up as needed and just be able to hear all this discussion that's going to play a factor in how decisions are made moving forward. So I want to just welcome them and, and uh, mm. introduce those folks as, as the, the need arises. Okay. Yeah, we want to move on to, to the actual stakeholders on, on the call. Again, thank you all for, for joining. Maybe we can just run through this list and you can introduce yourself real quick the way you're listed there, then we can just uh, say hello. Is Zach here? Uh, I'll start with the uh, Access Fund. I'm, I'm Mike Reardon from the Carolina Climbers Coalition. Um, the Access Fund is our national affiliate. And um, Zach had to be in a um, Pisgah and a Hala meeting this morning. So we're kind of splitting between the two. Um, we're both supposed to be in two places at once. Um, so nice to meet you all and, and thanks for having us on the call. Great, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name again and I apologize. Uh, uh, I'm Mike Reardon from the Carolina Climbers Coalition and um, the Access Fund is our national affiliate. Gotcha, thanks Mike. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure we captured that. And we're, we're a nonprofit and we cover um, all different climbing areas, uh, stewardship and access in um, North Carolina, South Carolina, a bit of Virginia, a little bit of Tennessee as well. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you. Morgan, you here? <clears throat> ah, looks like Morgan is just joining, so. All right, well, go ahead. Uh, Marilyn, you want to say hello? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not on screen. I, I have a, an older computer. Uh, but my name is Marilyn Westfall, and I'm from the Carolina Bird Club, which is a group of uh, between six and 700 members uh, in North and South Carolina that meets three times a year, uh, except this year, of course. And um, we are all birders, of course. And we use the, the different wild areas a lot for birding purposes. Um, I'm not sure what else you'd like to know. I, I am a, on the board of the Carolina Bird Club, have been for about three years now, and um, probably have another year to go. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. And uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I see Morgan there. Morgan, you there? Is your mic working? Yes. Can you hear me? So just say hey. And Morgan Somerville, Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Great, glad you could join us, Morgan. Appreciate that. Um, 
And we, we got Mike, who's covering both Access Fund and Carolina Climbers. Good. And then Green River, John, you're here. <clears throat> yeah, my name is John Grace. I'm the president of the Green River Access Fund Board. Uh, we're a nonprofit dedicated to uh, paddling access to the Green River. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Guy, did you make it? Oh. No, Guy, Guy said he had to be in court today. I, I know Guy. Oh, uh, darn. Well, yeah, I thought I saw his picture at the post office, but no, I'm just kidding. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, Heather, you here? Yeah, he said he might be able to join a little later. Okay, thanks. That's great. I appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. that info with us, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Heather, you here? She's here, but she's muted. There you go. I am here, yes. I'm the newly elected vice president of the North Carolina Backcountry Horsemen. I'm also a member of uh, Uari uh, Backcountry Horsemen and live adjacent to Uari National Forest property. Oh, okay, so you're a landowner too. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you. Um, and David, you here? I was looking, I didn't... You're muted if you are, David. There's that man in of Pisgah, or that Pisgah meeting is going on. He might be part of that too, so we might just be missing missing David. Yeah, but I see a David on here with a mute. That's all. He might be with us. That might be David Stewart. Okay, just double checking. Good. And then uh, Tom. Hard to remember to unmute, Tom, sorry. Yeah, I do it all the time. <laughs> I'm sure it was brilliant. I did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I am uh, uh, the executive director of Sorba, Pisgah area Sorba is one of our 45 uh, chapters. We have uh, chapters throughout seven southeastern states. And uh, I too was supposed to be on the, the call with Zach this morning and uh, uh, the rec committee for the Nantahala uh, Pisgah forest planning. But um, I've got someone else to cover that so I could be here. But we are, uh, 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 you know, the um, mountain biking Sorba uh, and our national affiliate IMBA uh, are representing mountain biking interests today. So Great. nice to be here. Glad you're here, Tom. Thank you. I know as a, we couldn't find any good days. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's discovered they can meet online and they're meeting even more often, right? Yeah. So, hey, Mike, you here? Here. I'm here. Hi, all. I'm Mike Mahalis. I am with North Carolina Trout Unlimited. We have 14 chapters and around 4,500 members throughout the state. Wow. Uh, so I'll be representing uh, representing those those trout anglers. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you all could be here. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody. So the purpose of today's session is really to review the Sunday hunting on game lands options that were generated during the online survey and the public meetings that we held. And hopefully this group can, can work together and refine and expand those options, alternatives, and criteria, but further develop any pros and cons for each alternative or criteria. And, and also think about game lands in terms of categories or types and maybe develop criteria for, for certain kinds of game lands. So urban game lands, rural game lands, rural game lands with you know multiple users and different types of activities. We're looking for types of criteria to consider for guiding sunny hunting on these lands that we're hoping you can help us develop today. Then I have a, a short discussion about willingness to pay essentially for access. So that came out of some of the listening sessions. You've heard that quite frequently throughout the recent years here, just want to touch on that a little bit. And then time permitting, depending on how the discussion is going, get into specific, you know, game land recommendations. But we'll just have to see how, how the discussion goes and where we end up with that. So really just reiterating a little bit about what we're looking to do today. So over 30,000 responses were received from our online survey and, and during our listening sessions about this topic. And we did hear a lot of different ideas and a lot of ideas related to 100% you know, positions or almost all or none ideas. And we're hoping to stay away from that today. We're really looking for 
compromise ideas, what's, what's possible, what do possible options look like that are okay for folks. Um, and we want to essentially advance a solution that that's realistic. And that's different than everybody fully supporting a given solution. You know, can you live with it? Is this okay? Um, you know, we're fully aware we're going to disappoint you today, but we're hoping we can disappoint you at an acceptable level and, and <laughs> find a compromise, make multiple compromises. But what, what does that look like? And, you know, what are the, the elements of a, of a fair solution? Those are, those are kind of the big ideas and the big topics that we, we hope to cover today. So, so your charge for today, and I'm sure you have already, but assess the game lands or types of game lands that you are familiar with and think about these options, these alternatives, these ideas. And work with this group today, create the non-win-lose options for, for, for alternatives in terms of implementing sunny hunting on game lands. Where possible, it would be ideal to provide recommendations that reflect consensus or strong agreement for this group. You know, we want to generate criteria or options for, for us to consider as we're proposing changes to these game lands. That's what we hope to, to, to achieve today. And just a little, little bit of background about where we are and how we got here in terms of sunny hunting on game lands. If Vern, you want to go to the next slide, maybe? Thank you. So just to remind folks, you know, the Outdoor Heritage Act of 2015, that, that act removed the prohibition on hunting with firearms on Sunday. And, you know, that, that prohibition was in place since 1868. In, in 2017, the Outdoor Heritage Enhanced Act was passed, and that granted authority to the commission to implement rules regarding hunting on Sunday on game lands. We've been hard at work at that ever since. And, and that's what's been facilitating some of these, these conversations. So the, the Outdoor Heritage Enhance Act, it still did have some prohibitions in it. Specifically, it does still prohibit hunting with a firearm between 9.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., prohibits hunting deer use of dogs, and prohibits hunting within 500 yards of a place of worship. Now, just as a point of clarification, there, there is verbiage in that act about hunting migratory birds on Sundays. That's a whole different ball of wax, and, and we're not diving into that one today. Just wanted to make clear that that was one topic that we're not really touching today. As far as the timeline, and there, can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. What? Why? Why was the uh, migratory bird one left out from the Sunday hunting? Just, just to if you have a quick answer. Sure. Um, aside from saying it's complicated and complex in terms of number of days that are allowed for hunting migratory waterfowl, um, how many days we were allowed from the federal government to allow hunting those animals is, is limited. And if we allow hunting on Sunday for waterfowl, that affects those days. And there's a, a lot to consider with that. And we've been through a little bit of a process on that already. And, um, that's really its own entire topic and focus group. So we're, we're, uh, I was that, just curious. Yeah, not touching that one. <laughs> yeah, no. National treaties, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, good question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, in terms of the timeline and where we've been and where we're going, you know, to date we've had six public meetings, which a number of folks have attended. With that, we did have two virtual meetings and gained a lot of insight and, and input. Our next step was to have these, these focus group meetings. We did not intend, intend for them or expect them to be virtual, but uh, that's where we are now, and that's what we're trying to, trying to accomplish. We have one today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. We're going to knock out those three focus groups this week. Once these focus groups are completed, Brian and Brett, they'll complete a, a summary and, and provide that to us. And then we're going to have a little WRC retreat. So number of folks on this call that were listed will be attending. Number of folks with diverse interests in public lands and outdoor recreation will participate. 
but our charge is to actually take the information gained from public meetings and these virtual focus groups and come up with very specific recommendations to provide to our commissioners to consider. So we're going to have that wildlife resource commission retreat sometime in July. Once we complete that retreat and have specific recommendations, we're going to reach out to the various landowners. So U.S. Forest Service, Army Corps of Engineers, Duke Energy, now those groups who have some of their property enrolled in the Game Lands program and talk to them about these specific options and recommendations if and where they, they exist. At that time, we, we will hope to reach back out to these focus group participants. So likely one big Zoom call with participants from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and just a follow-up, just to let you know where, where these options and ideas landed in terms of a recommendation we, we hope to provide to our commission. And in that, we hope to give them a final report in the, the August, September timeframe for them to digest it and get an idea of all that we were proposing, if there is something. But then if there is a decision to be made, that will come in October at the October commission meeting. That's when any proposed rules get, get approved. And and if a proposed rule gets approved, then that enters into our typical public hearing process. Um, it will be any proposed rules related to this and any of our rules will be presented at the January public hearings. There will be an open comment period for those rules. And if any rule does pass or, or, or does receive approval, it won't become effective until August of 2021. That's kind of the timeline we're looking at, and, and as with any of our rules, you know, we will be evaluating them. For these specifically, the Sunday Hunting on Game Lands, we'll be looking for conflicts, we'll be looking for issues that arise, and and if needed, make changes or tweaks to those, those rules. Um, as with many of our rules, when it comes to the changes, whether it's biological changes or changes related to human behavior, we need to give it some time to, to, to see how they play out, and that timeline is you know, three, four, five years sometimes we really see how these changes take, take effect. Um, but as changes are needed, as conflicts arise, as tweaks are needed, we, we have the opportunity to change rules and, and that's what we'll be looking to do if, if and when that's needed. That's really our, our timeline. Now moving on to the group solutions and, you know, Brett and Brent introduced themselves a little bit, but yeah, they're the, the neutral third party facilitator that we've hired and been working with us for a while now on this topic. And they're really the group that's helping us collect viable options and ideas to, to inform the commission to make a, a decision on this issue. And they've been facilitating our public meetings to these focus groups. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brett. Thanks, Brian. Glad to be here and, and our role really is to get your ideas in. We, we've done that through the listing sessions, we've done that through the surveys and we've basically been charged with listening hard and finding that middle ground where we can find it. And so today that's what we're diving into. Um, so I want to listen to everyone. Key, key thing is we got a great chat tool here if you haven't discovered it already and if there are ideas or anything you want to make sure we get in specific wording or otherwise, if you put in the chat tool, it will be captured there. Vern will be taking notes as we go, and he's really good at note taking. But uh, if you've got something specific, you can always just put it in the chat and we'll get it. it it's going to be tagged there. You can send it to the whole group or you can privately send it to Vern or me or whatever you want to do. Totally up to you. Um, there is a hand raise icon uh, and, and you can do that. It's up, up there just under the participant list. So if you want to say, hey, I got something to say, great. But if not, just just wait. There'll be There'll be pauses and we'll be pausing to let you guys do the talking in just a sec. Um, my only request is if we're right on wrapping up a topic and it looks like we're coming in for closure, let's finish that before you bring your new comment in and then we'll start a new discussion. Sometimes it, it'll keep us from jumping around. We really have limited time. Um, we'll do this morning session. We'll take us to about 11. You know, if we need to, we can go over a little great. Doesn't matter to me. Um, we'll take a couple hour break, give everybody a chance to refresh, defresh and <laughs> get some fresh air and then we'll come back at one and go to three, whatever, until the last person, you know, has comments in there. 
Um, so we're really trying to drive to closure on the key big ideas that we can. And um, we may do some polling. We got some great polling options in Zoom, which are nice, uh, just on, to reach some closure on some options. And as Brian said, we are recording as we go. So as we move through, next slide, Bert. Um, here's our agenda. It's really, that overview is done. Let's look at the options and alternatives that we've got thus far. And let's talk about that. Uh, we will be, we get an option and we can flesh it and we get some pros and cons. So I think we'll be going back and forth between the criteria for assessing how we would, or the commission would make a decision and what an option might look like. And those things are very much intertwined. We found that out in the public meetings. So it's really talking about options and the why, why would you make that option? What criteria would you use to make that option or recommend the commission use to make that option? And pros and cons. I mean, if, if there's an option that seems like it's coming in for landing, you go, well, the pros are it'll handle this, but the cons are, and we wanna capture that. Our job is to frame things out. So big ideas that I wanna say is, we are gonna move fast. Um, we're seeking consensus, as Brian says, we'll settle for no no's. Um, which is the lowest form of consensus I can find is no one says no to an idea, but anywhere that we can come up with strong agreement, my impression, and I think Brian will confirm is the stronger our agreement levels are, the more impact it will certainly will have as a recommendation. Um, you know, we are, we know the option of no hunting on Sunday. We have that option uh, for, for on, on game lands. And we know the option of open every game land. We got those two. Um, that hasn't gotten us anywhere since the, the, since the law is put in. So I think if we can find something in the middle, fabulous. Uh, and that's where we are. So uh, without further ado, let's look at our options. Hey, Brett, real quick. Um, Morgan just posted a question in the chat about would any proposal affect game lands in uh, national forests? And uh, yeah, Morgan, right now we're just talking about all lands. And when it comes to options or alternatives or proposals, you know, we need to talk to the Forest Service about that and uh, um, get their support and, and see what they're comfortable doing or not. So that, that will have to wait for, for that discussion. Yeah, and back up one slide, Vern. I believe that in, in your timeline, one more, I'm sorry, Vern. Uh, in your timeline, Brian, keep going. Uh, there's a discussion there. That's the landowner discussions piece, Morgan, in the bullet there, that fourth bullet. Once we have some options, once staff is really considered thing, the, the, the stakeholders, the landowners that, that we have leases from, they're waiting for this process and then they want to see what the informed input looks like. So that hence that conversation will happen after the, the WRC retreat. And we'll report back after that. So thanks. Go ahead, Vern. Jump up to our options piece. There you go. All right. So just a little respect today. Um, simplicity is better. We heard that loud and clear. Don't make something too complicated. Um, each game land is open for discussion. So, you know, if, if shared use, whatever we want to do, um, we'll try to use the data to guide us where we can. We have some pretty good data from the survey. And I think ultimately the, the commission will be using data to make final decisions and this qualitative and quantitative data. And I think this qualitative stuff from stakeholders is important. So let's look at our options as we uh, start forward. The alternatives that we were able to generate quickly, uh, here they are. Um, there is no order that we need to start with. So I'm gonna throw the floor open for someone to say, here's a preferred alternative approach, or here's a preferred concern that I think we need to address in any alternative. And it's now open to you as a focus group to begin the discussions. So take it away. Well, the, can I go ahead then? Please do. Uh, well, there's, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a couple here that I've discussed with some folks and um, the the limit hunting other days of the week, that, that's an option. As far as birders go, they, they'd be, I think a lot of them would be open to that option. Uh, so, so what I'm saying is if, if you have to have Sundays, if, we could have, if you could have no hunting on Monday, Tuesday, something like that, 
I think a lot of uh, a lot of birders would be okay with that. Um, and the the one thing that I the, the trail buffers when I I live in Western North Carolina, and of course, so we have big forests here. We're talking about, and the trail buffer thing would work fine for most most people. I for both birders and uh, hikers and um, bikers and all that. I think that would be a good option as far as we're all concerned. Okay. Um, yeah, and and uh, so. Th those two top bullets uh, resonate, Marilyn, with you and the bird birding group. Mm. Got it. Other other reactions. What can one other one other just a? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, can we clarify what um a tr what trail buffers means? Yes, uh, there is a. Um, this came out of our uh, listening sessions, and those were putting in a. Let's say at a property like Jordan, where you have a lot going on or you have big trails going through, this would be giving a wide buffer zone between if you were allowing Sunday hunting and where hikers or others might be using the trail, that there was a sufficient distance. So if you had a trail buffer then um, and Sunday hunting was allowed, I'm just trying to make sure I understand that, that bullet point. It would be hunters um, on Sunday specifically would not be allowed to hunt near that trail, but would be allowed to hunt in other parts of the game lands where there is not a designated trail, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that was the thought. And it would be uh, kind of that share of use concepts where we heard from again, particularly, you know, if you think about, I, I, I use Jordan kind of as the example because a lot of that discussion really folks were <laughs> pinpointing. But the idea of this, it was about safety, it was about giving enough buffer where people felt like they could use the trail and not feel that there was any safety issues from, you know, uh, from the hunter. Okay. Would that, would that limit cross country travel for <clears throat> non hunters? It could. And we could talk about that. Um, and so we can, we can talk about that. I think that is a pro or a con, or it is another alternative. <clears throat> and it, it, it's also related to that bullet there in the lower right, require all, everybody to wear blaze during hunting season. So that could right. impact it as well as you, as you uh, think about um, you know, that. So there's, there's, there's a variety of these that, that can be knitted together as you're seeing um, Mike, I think it's, um, so. Okay. I, I ask because, um, uh, most climbing areas in the game lands do not have an official trail <laughs> um, that go to the base of them, um, or, or that, you know, ascend the, the cliff faces or boulders. Um, right. and so if, you know, if it, if the, Expand trail buff buffers bullet point means that um, cross country travel for non hunters is limited. Then um, that would greatly limit climbing. Um, yeah, it, would, it would it would impact it. So if it meant a limit, if it meant that, or the flip side of that could be, and I just get your reaction to this while you're, we're still on this topic. Um, mm -hmm. The reaction to that could be that if there is a because I know there are bouldering and cliffs in certain places, they're, they're not in every game land, right, Mike? I mean, it's just Correct. specific spot. The flip side of that could be that those could be part of the buffer. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that, you know, kind of the pro and con, you could say, well, look, we, there's only one place to boulder in all of North Central Carolina, and it's here, you know? And right. we have a lot of climbers that would use that. Could that be part of a buffer? I mean, that would be an idea that we could share as well. And I know okay. you're right now, but. Others, Morgan, I saw you demuted. Did you have something? Yeah, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy currently has no position on Sunday hunting. Um, certainly along about 60% of the Appalachian Trail hunting is allowed during hunting seasons. And we publish those seasons on our website and encourage everybody to wear blaze orange. Um, on this list, the last three bullets on the right-hand column all sound like interesting alternatives. Our main concern is safety. 
Yeah. Uh, hikers, of course. And, and I'd like to say um, the allowing uh, 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 the select game lands uh, might be uh, something the mountain bikers would support. We have uh, chapters in North Carolina, like in Wilmington, that this doesn't really affect them, uh, at least for their local riding. But in Western North Carolina, uh, if it is, uh, as Morgan has asked, the proposal will affect the wildlife management areas, the national forests. Almost all of the mountain biking, of course, in Western North Carolina is in the national uh, uh, forest. So that would be another one that um, I would hope we, uh, you know, would look at specific permits for specific game lands. Got it. So that that option. Let's let's uh, let's think about either two things. We were kind of buffers. Any other thing on buffers? Because I want to kind of thoughts on that. I and and, and no, that makes complete sense uh, to me. Yeah. How would so, that? It's very hard to enforce that, but yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I know. Uh, and and we talked about how would you mark that, Morgan? You know, how would you delineate those trails and what those distances might be? So truly hard to enforce. We see that. Tom, uh, the climbers have said. Mike said that uh, you know they have specific areas for bouldering and climbing. That exactly. if there was a buffer, they'd like at least a way in. Um, same with trails uh, for for streams. Thoughts on that? I'm just asking to close that comment down. For, for your trout anglers, would they? Yeah, I mean, certainly we need to be able to go off trail onto sort of fisherman trails or social trails to get access to cert certain waters. So yeah. um, that, that would have to be considered. Got it, and, and, and for the bikers, um, okay, good. All right, uh, so we've talked about those buffers piece. Um, we've talked a little about- Can I ask one more, one more thing on the buffers? Uh, this, uh, I, I'm assuming we're, you could only deal with official trails, marked trails, is that right? Yes. Okay. And so that's kind of leads to, you know, that, that comment that Mike made around the idea, uh, Marilyn, that, you know, hey, there's, a, you know, it, what about folks that really need to wander to get to either a stream as, as you know, Mike was talking about, or to get to a uh, uh, you know a a, a uh, place to boulder uh, so those kinds of things um, you know clearly and I think Heather from a horseback riding perspective I know you like that cross country stuff we talked to a lot of your folks but could you be okay with trails with bigger buffers just on those Sunday pieces for sure um, yes uh, I think uh, a lot of horse people also hunt I do myself. Yeah. And uh, we want to be respectful to the short season that the hunters have. And most of the people that I ride with uh, aren't even interested in rambling off of a well-marked trail during hunting season. We try to give them their space. Right. <clears throat> and I think the buffers would be great if, you know, we could stay where we're supposed to stay and they could not be right on top of us during that short season, I think. I think it would be pretty easy to work together, at least in my area, that's what I hear people say. They say, I wear orange and I stay right on the trail during hunting season. I do hear a lot of that, but I do feel that the buffers uh, would be hard to enforce. Yeah, it's pretty tough. And if you do accidentally uh, break the buffer, I can see where user conflict would just explode, like you're in my area and then you have a big argument. I yeah. can see that happening. Yeah. Got it. So that's the, that's the con of buffers is pro is, you know, it, it could help. Uh, cons are um, difficult to enforce and we would have to have a lot of potential new set aside buffers for climbing or getting to streams or other things. Um, but you're saying you're okay with the fact that during hunting season, we wouldn't be rambling on our horseback. That's what I hear the vast majority of, of horse riders say that, you know, it's only a short season, a few months, we can stay, you know, where we're supposed to stay pretty strictly. That's my take on it. And that's what I hear most people say. Well, let's go to the orange piece because we, we have discussed that. Um, hey, let me ask one thing, Brett. So 
with the, the buffers, is there any concern about that being confusing? If these buffers, are we talking about them only being active on Sundays? Is that confusing to users? Any concern about that? Can I chime in here? Please. First, thanks to everybody for putting on this meeting and NC Wildlife has been a great organization to work with over the years. Um, I, everybody here is a huge fan of public lands um, for sure. The buffer idea is, is tricky because a lot of times, especially in the winter, if you just want to go exploring, look for something new out in the game lands that's off trail, you know, you just look at a topographic map, want to go see if there's a cool waterfall or something on a creek, you know, ha that's, that's limiting access to a huge amount of public land. Um, and certainly if you're doing that during hunting season, it's obvious that you wear orange. Um, but would that buffer restriction mean that you couldn't wander off trail during hunting season? Is that how that would work? That your thoughts on that, John, it sounds like that, that's a con. The con would be, you know, well, a, a, a issue that you would raise about that would be to clarity on, can you wander in the woods on during hunting season if you're wearing orange? And the answer is you can do that now. Um, the question I think for the option is really to look at it to say, do we, we, we're not saying that you can only stay on trails. That would be kind of the issue. And it might be different where you say horseback riders, um, you know, um, you, you know, no rambling during that, or I don't know. I mean, this, this is a group that needs to right. do that. So you're pointing out the, the fact that there are a lot of people that ramble and they ramble in orange blaze and they do it during hunting season. They're already doing it. So that's, that's really, I think topically, um, you know, that's a personal taking that risk to, to, to go. It's like you go to the grocery store without your mask up to you, you know? Yeah. So, so um, from a regulatory standpoint, I think you could work that one of two ways. I think it could be, you know, you don't ramble off the trail or hunters have to stay X number of yards from trails um, during hunting season. So I think there's two options there. Um, I don't think either is simple <laughs> or easy to enforce, but I think there's two ways you could work it. Yeah, you could work it either ways. And, and uh then, you know, so, and, and, and the key is, is that, that it, it's, I, the, the other issue that crept in there was also, does this mean only on Sundays? And um, my take on it would be, you know, again, another one of those complicated things of, well, if you made it only for Sunday, then, you know, how's everybody going to know this and the communications piece, which one of our, one of our clear principles that we had early on was don't make it complicated. Don't make it complicated. You know, make it easy the other piece that came out quite a bit in the listening sessions that, that, that we heard loud and clear is signage um, and demarcation stuff would be important. You know, nothing more important. Heather, we heard this a lot from, from the, the horseback community as well. The, the, the saying, boy, it would be so, if we know people are in there, we, you know, it's okay. We, we just, we would like to know what, where people are or what they're doing out there so we, we can make choices. And we heard a lot of that from folks about, it's nice to know. So signage was important and information about how to, uh, who was out there and, and where they were was important. We heard a lot of that in terms of communicating at the parking lot, what's going on on the property. Um, so a lot of that came through as well. I, I would like to say that overall in general, I, I have no problems with hunting on any day of the week. Um, for us, you know, let's say that we're going to work on a trail or an access point we schedule that on Sunday as not to interfere with the hunters more than we're worried about the hunters interfering with us, if that makes any sense. So, I mean, if there's hunting seven days a week, how would we schedule something like that to not interfere during hunting season? So that looking at all of this, that is my over line, you know, kind of where my thoughts go is um, if there's, you know, maybe if there was one day a month where there was, you know, how do we schedule? So there's no, uh, you know, keep no user conflict, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and that's important, John. Well, two things that jump out, and again, I'm not creating alternatives, but um, 
you would schedule early on a Sunday since there's no hunting until after 1230. Number one. Uh, and number two, uh, so that, that, that window is get there in the morning. And then, of course, if you're there in the morning making a lot of noise, the chances of a hunter coming in that area are pretty low anyway. Yeah, I hear you. Because they made it real clear to us as we talked to all the hunting groups, I don't want to hunt where there are a lot of people because, the, you know, that's, that's not going to work for me anyway. So that's what we heard. But I'm just pointing out that on Sunday, since that's when you are, you say you generally are scheduling, it would be early. Okay. One, one, one just point of clarification there, that would be fine, but the prohibition on, on Sunday is only that window between 9.30 and 12.30. So I would very much expect folks to be in their hunting at daylight and, and taking advantage of that opportunity and then probably getting out of there um, and, and maybe that's their day. So just, just want to make sure that's clear and, you know, John, I think people appreciate the work you're doing and, and acknowledging that that's, you know, work has to get done at some point. That's just part of the user groups that, that we got to find a way to, to interact. I think, I think that's, that's part of it. Yeah. I, I, like I say, I'm fully fine with hunting on Sunday. I'm just trying to stay out of people's way and that's the way I've found to do it best. Can I, can I say something? Uh, the, for, for me, I think that uh, is, if we, we have the buffers, I think the easiest, the simplest thing would be to, it would just apply on Sunday for hunters not to uh, hunt within above the buffer zone of the trails. If we try to try to make rules for everybody else, it's going to get very complicated. So, and they won't understand. There's just, uh, you know, you can have signs if you like, but, uh, you know, yeah, I think the less complicated, the better, like you said. So, the, the, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to talk about the, the trail buffers again. I, I, th I think the big thing that trips a lot of us up in that bullet point is the term trail. Um, because so many users of the, um, of the game lands are not on designated trails. I mean, this is, it's um, anglers, um, uh, paddlers, climbers, um, uh, birders as well are probably not necessarily on a, a designated trail system. Um, and there, there's only a certain percentage of, of game land users that are going to stick to a trail. And that's, that's basically hikers and bikers. Um, and so by by saying that there's a trail buffer on a, a certain amount of time, you're limiting all of those other activities. Um, I, the only way I, s that I can imagine being around that would be um, taking kind of a, a, a recreation access inventory of um, access corridors. Um, so not calling it trails, calling it access corridors, um, two different areas. And, but you'd have to have an inventory of what those different areas are. Um, and that's the, that's kind of the sticky point there um, is getting all of that mapped. Um, and then somehow still making it simple to get out to the public. Um, and, and that's a challenge right there. Yeah, it's a good point, Mike. Um, yeah, I question for you, Mike, what are you doing now um, on, let's just say Saturdays during hunting season for those access points? Um, it, it, our, our main thing is to wear orange during, during hunting season. Um, and I mean, and um, people have been climbing throughout the game land since the 1950s in North Carolina. And before this call, I <laughs> tried to contact as many climbers as I could find asking if there's ever been a hun hunter climber conflict and there just hasn't. Um, right. Uh, it hasn't that I, I have found, um, uh, on record. Got it. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of in um, John's same boat there where uh, we are fine with hunting on at all, all points in time um, as far as, as climbers go. It, it, there's not, not much of a um, conflict there for us. It's just that if we restrict on Sundays, if we were to restrict that you had to stay on trails, that would be a problem for you and John. Yeah. That would be a problem. Uh, 
and and maybe even uh, Mike for some of your trout it, and your anglers. So. Yeah, that that would certainly be a problem for trout anglers. Sure. There, there's actually a section of the Chattooga River that um, has a rule in place that you can't go off trail in that area, and it's always been very confusing for anglers. Well, I can't go off the trail to get to the river that's ten yards away <laughs> from the trail. So the result yeah. is everybody ignores it because nobody knows how to how to navigate it properly. Yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, anglers, you know, they may use a trail to get to a creek and then fish up that creek and then get out of the creek to go around a waterfall and then get back in the creek. And all that would have to be accounted for on every creek in, in every game land. And that, I just don't think it would be practical. I, agree with that. I, I don't think it will no, be followed. Now, can I just say that that's why I said it, it should only apply to the hunters. It should limit anybody else. It should just apply to the hunters staying away from the trails. Anybody can go wherever they want now. So why not? Why change that? Right. So it's just the, just the buffers for the hunters is what the point would be there, Marilyn. I got that one. So right. mm -hmm. not providing any restrictions on the others. Uh, the only bullet that I think becomes important, and it sounds like certainly Sorba does this. I know the climbers, you've said that, and I'm sure you're, you're anybody that's regularly out in, in, during hunting season, they're wearing blaze orange. And that was a big issue that we had and we talked about, should everybody wear blaze orange? Any reactions to that? That's common sense to well, me. Well, the only, yeah, it's common sense, but it's not, if you're a birder, wearing blaze orange doesn't help you birding, but, uh, but you know, it can cope with it. Yeah, and, and that, that to me was, was one that we thought kind of, kind of, you know, came up, there was a bunch. And then even for the hunting community, uh, for turkey and, and, and um, you know, different game bird seasons, the idea of wearing blaze orange, even to the hunters was kind of problematic. So we had a lot of discussion about blaze orange. Uh, uh, all right, well, um, how about, and we, I think we've gotten there. So what I'm hearing on trail buffers is, uh, a workable idea, generally applying it to, um, generally applying it, what we're saying is make those buffers for Sunday hunting for the hunters in general. We're not restricting other users. Um, we may say there may be places where, you know, we might say no, no horseback riding off trail or things like that or biking or whatever. There could be some of those, but minimize that kind of stuff, make it simple uh, and probably either pass a law or you either require or highly recommend that people be in blaze orange, which, you know, most people that are regularly out in the woods are anyway. So those are the big ideas I heard there. Did I miss anything big on that? Right, can I ask a question real quick? Um, do all you folks get word out or know when the hunting seasons are? So do your folks know when hunting seasons are? So they know when to wear blaze orange or when, to, you know, when other users are going to be out? I think that certainly during deer season, um, everybody is aware of it. Maybe some of the, um, and I'd say turkey season for the most part, but some of the other seasons, it probably gets a little blurry. Got it. And, and to Morgan's point in there, um, I'm sure I think it's a good one. Um, you've got, you know, 25 year record of two, not, not no fatalities, but two uh, gunshot wounds on the trail. Uh, and it looks like both were uh, kind of, one was on the trail and one was uh, kind of rambling, Morgan. And you know, not sure if they were wearing orange at all. So that's, so that kind of gets you that safety. We, we heard a lot about safety, by the way, in our meetings, as you might expect. Um, and uh, lots of discussion. Uh, Heather, the, the, the rider and community was one of those too, you know, the, my horse was shot or, you know, da, da, da. And so, and, and we've looked at kind of the, the safety data across the planet. I think we've had that discussion about what safety feels like and do, can, can guns and horses work together? Can, can other user groups and, and, and guns work together, you know, in terms of hunting? We've had a lot of that discussion. So uh, what, what is the data on that? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Heather. I didn't mean to talk, talk okay. over you. Me or Go you, who's going? <laughs> Heather, you were, then we'll do data if you want. I just wanted to answer Carrie's question there. Um, since I live right across from actually some food plots and such here 
at Uari. Um, I know when deer hunting season is simply because I'm a deer hunter, but I often just ride up on a group of bird hunters in the field and our trail happens to go right down the edge of the trail. And I'm like, oh my God, there's dogs and bird hunters with ground level with shotguns and I had no idea. So I do know that there's not like a public knowledge or any signs up at any of the parking lots that uh, bird season is in or rabbit season or deer season, uh, wear orange. I haven't seen any notification of hunting seasons in the parking areas or at the local um, sportsman store there where everyone gets their license and permits. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, and I think that, that Heather, that's consistent with what we heard at all the, the listening sessions was that that idea of if I get to the parking lot, it would be nice to know. Yes. And that signage, that communication piece during, we heard a lot of that, yes. so thank you for reiterating. And there, we can uh, stay was, out of the way. I didn't catch that. Was it Mike who was, who was talking just before Heather came in? We were talking about data. Oh yeah, I asked, is, do you have any information on people who have been, other user groups who have been shot in the game lands over the years? There is data. So I, I think we do. I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm, I'm aware of, I believe, one incident in the past 10 years, but that's just off the top of my head. I would have to go to our enforcement officers and get, get those data. I've, off the top of my head, I, I think there's re really low incidences of that happening. Yeah, I, I've personally never heard of it, but I'm, I'm sure it happens, but I'm you know, just well, wondering what- Well, I've seen it, I, I've seen it in the news um, here, but it's more, it's, you know, there there was a plant poacher that got shot uh, a few years back, and there was somebody. I think uh, that more of the problems I hear are people live when hunters are near where people live. Um, when they get too close to to habitation. Yeah, it's um the 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 national data is fairly low. Um, you know, and and our our hunting groups. Um, we're on a basic rallying cry that, you know, waterfalls are more dangerous. I mean, we heard a lot of that kind of, you know, stuff in the talking points in our listening sessions. But I think overall, um, um, look at it, it's a fairly low incidence na nationally. Um, and there are, you know, there are other issues that are, um, that are, that are, that are bigger in terms of um, safety. The, the other thing is, I think, at least as far as birders are concerned, most of them avoid game lands during hunting season. Right. And I think, you know, the issue here for all of us is the idea that people have, they're accustomed to being out on Sundays. And, and then all of a sudden now you have this window where those Sundays are, um, there'll be other user groups there. And that's really kind of the question. It's not you know, it, it, it's, John said it, I think you said it well, you, you plan your activities for Sunday in terms of trail repair or anything you're going to be doing in terms of um, access points, et cetera. And you've been reliant on Sundays to do that. And that what's the impact gonna be for those Sunday users? But, as, but there are very few people that are during hunting season, people understand that Saturday you know, so can we, is it going to be easy to move that to a Sunday where we get the same kind of uh, attention? How do we communicate that? Those, those are the, the, the issues that I see there, so. So Marilyn, can I, can I ask a follow up to that comment? Um, you, you mentioned birders typically just don't go birding on game land during the hunting season. Is that the entire hunting season or, or including Sundays? I just want to get clarification on. on no. No, they count on being able to go on Sundays. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, looking around, um, let's 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 hit a few other bullets. Uh, so we, we, I mean, I think this has been a cohesive uh, discussion. Let's um, let's look at the idea of um, maybe select game lands as a concept. Um, it was a big option that came up. Maybe there's, maybe there's 
I, I, I just say it's horseback riding only, or uh, you know, during hunting season, I'm talking about you know, horseback riding only, or there's uh, uh, biking only, or there's you know, hunting only. On you know, are there? What are your thoughts on that idea of maybe having some designations on game land? I mean, we're what we're talking about now is clearly shared utilization on Sundays with maybe buffers and some safety issues we've discussed. But what about the idea of saying, hey, you know, this is a, uh, let's just make these designated areas so the birders and or bikers or whatever know about that. And of course, out West, that's pretty tough because, you know, whether you're Pisgah, Nanahale, I mean, you're, you're talking about big chunks of property, very different. But thoughts on that idea of maybe designated game lands um, for specific things, kind of directing certain kinds of traffic in certain ways. That doesn't work for the AT, obviously, because <laughs> there's one AT, but how about like for biking or, or things like that? Is that does that make any sense? Well, I, I said earlier that, and yeah, and for our members, um, those in, in Western North Carolina are, are going to uh, be more effective than, uh, uh, and, and, uh, than other places in the state where they have a lot of alternatives uh, if they're uncomfortable riding um, uh, it, during hunting season. Um, so yeah, we would be interested in, in this discussion and, and, what, uh, and I'm interested in what the others have to say about it, um, Claude. Yeah, it's, this, is a, this is tougher. How difficult would that be to do? And, you know. Yeah, exactly. And so if, for like a Pisgah, I mean, it's such a big piece of property, you know, and, and that it may not be as applicable West as a concept as it might be East where you've got more fragmented and much smaller game lines in general. So I, yeah, just reactions to that overall, the idea of saying, hey, um, for Sundays, um, can we direct traffic in a particular area? If that, it may not. I, I, yeah, no, I, I just want to say that I, I, you know, I live in Western North Carolina, so I'm, we have so many choices here that we are spread out. But I, I don't really know about the folks in the Eastern and Piedmont area, right. uh, if what their limitations might be more. There, it's a different, it's a different thing. And that's why we kind of chose regionally because there are some, some differences. So any reactions though? I mean, it, it, does that even merit any more discussion from, from a Western perspective? Yeah. In general, I don't like the idea of limiting public access to public lands. So just in general, but it's uh, hard for me so, to come yeah, up. So the, just everybody ought to be able to go. So I'm hearing everybody ought to be able to go everywhere. I, until there's a really big problem or whatnot, I feel that that's a, it just seems favoring one group over another group and yeah. it's just, just a hard precedent for me. Yeah. Yeah. We, and we, we heard that loud and clear from all users, by the way. Um, and uh, certainly out West, it's, it's, it, 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 it is a lesser piece, but I wanted to put that up. Any other thoughts on this idea of, you know, Hey, you know, on Sundays, you know, bikers, you know, only here or hunters only there. I mean, like I said, it, there are places probably east where maybe that's going to make more sense than it is where you guys are. I'm with I'm with John on it. Um, I, I'm, I, I'd find it really difficult for anyone to swallow, especially in Western North Carolina, um, limiting access to area. I mean, like the you know, the game lands in, in Pisgah, I, you just cannot um, say one user can use it and one can't, um, it, it, that just won't work. Yep, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I agree. It would be way too confusing in Western North Carolina in any event. Okay, how about the, uh, how about this idea of um, monitoring for capacity? Again, Who's I'll, gonna do that? <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I, out west again. You've got these huge properties, like you said. There's plenty of room to spread out. Uh, uh, back east, it's probably a little bit different. So I just tossed in that one out there. I wanted to hit all of these and get some input. Yeah, that's a tough one for me. 
to understand, especially with recreational users, I could see that coming into play with commercial users, but recreational limiting recreational, or I mean, until you, it gets so bad, you have to come up with some kind of lottery system or something like that. It just seems very, uh, uh, I, I don't understand that one um, until there's a very big problem. And I see that problem being remedied on the commercial front long before the recreational front. Got it. And, and again, these are the pros and cons we're trying to drive to, John. So that's exactly the kind of comments we're looking for. We don't have a preference. We're just trying to get reaction to. Any other thoughts on that one? Uh, do they have any problems in the smaller area, like in the eastern uh, North Carolina or, or in the Piedmont with that sort of thing with hunters? Do they have problems with overcrowding? We heard yes in the listing sections. But as you said, more east or the smaller properties. Um, you know, how many people can you actually get on a property? How many hunters can you get on a property? And then if you add other rec users on there and some of the smaller properties. Um, but again, you guys are looking at, uh, you know, a million acres. So it's a very different discussion. I, I think the biggest thing that could, could limit the capacity is just the parking. And, and how, how big do you build the parking is the, is the is the first question. Right. And then the second question is when that parking overflows, how do you enforce um, the parking when it be, when people start parking everywhere? Um, and if, uh, if you want limited capacity into an area, you have a smaller parking lot and, and call a tow truck when people park illegally. Um, and, uh, but if you don't mind, a larger amount of people in one area, then you build a park, bigger parking lot and you and don't have the enforcement. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's the only way I could see limiting capacity. Um, as a, as a recreational user, if I drive to a spot and there's people parking everywhere, uh, in every which way I'm, I'm just going to turn around and go somewhere else. Um, uh, but some people don't, yeah, you know, don't decide to do that and they, and they park on the side of the road or something. And, that causes other issues, but um, that's what we've seen. And we've seen that with state parks and so on, some that, that get hammered with um, different different climbing areas. And when those parking areas are smaller and the overflow is enforced, that really limits, that, that really starts telling the user groups to go elsewhere if the parking area is full and it creates a natural cap. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, so it, there is an, I mean, if you're enforcing, you're not in a parking space, you can't be here, then in some ways you, you are limiting capacity. So uh, a couple comments there. Heather, I wanted to get back to your comment in the chat, which I thought was um, um, worth talking about that idea of, yeah, you know, two riders that have been shot over the past two years. And uh, um, d d d that's, it just, a safety day is what you would be pushing there. So that's back to that, hey, Sunday's a safe day for riding if we don't have hunting. So you wanna expand on that or I, I just- Yeah, that in yeah that's not my personal uh, point or opinion. That is just what I hear out there. Yeah. But uh, I do know per, from personal experience, those two that were shot at and the man and the woman were, well, they were in full orange and the shooter did shoot with a rifle and it went right through the front of the saddle cut the reins in half. And uh, then the other lady was uh, shot um, an arrow by an archery shooter and the arrow just went down right by the horse. And what they're trying to do, I, I think, is scare the horse so he'll run off out of the area. Yeah. I think that was probably the reason. I don't particularly think they were trying to kill anybody, but, and then I think that just came from frustration of, you know, the hunter, I, I've sat out here for three hours waiting on the deer to come by and here you come riding through and scare my deer off. And so I'm not, I'm not sure what a solution is for that though. Um, but the horse riding is um, different than everything else because we're on a flight animal. Yeah. And when we're going down the trail and I see this all the time. There's a hunter, he has walked in on the horse trail, which we call a multi-purpose trail because it's hikers, bikers, horses. Sure. And he's leaning up against a tree or sitting down at the base of the tree with a rifle right beside the trail. And the horse rider comes along and sees that monster there. And then the horse whirls and runs and you're 
decapitated under a tree just about, you know. So it is a different, um, it is a different interaction with the horse people than it is with the other users. But I think that that's why they're justifying the uh, leave my Sunday alone, perhaps. Because I'll feel my personal opinion, but I can see where that would be coming from. And, and we heard it loud and clear. We talked to a lot of horseback riders, and they, they stated it pretty much that way that, you know, guns and horses don't, if they're close to each other and in proximity. But, you know, if you look at the example that you said there, it, it was clearly a, it's an example of a hunter that shouldn't be hunting on a trail anyway, you know, the idea that. You know, so, but yeah, I get it. We heard this conversation. So I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge that. Looks like we lost Morgan. Thank you, Morgan, if he's still here. Um, he said he'll send in written comments and, uh, he, but that he had to roll off and um, he, he, he put in. So if you, you take a peek at the chat there for Morgan's input. Um, all right. Um, so as we, um, some things we did mention. So we, we talked about, I think, about everything that third bullet um on the on the left hand margin that was an issue that said for from again it was one of those options that emerged that said well what if we promoted for biking and other things um you know the the state parks uh and and the local parks that have already have a lot of trails and things there and help kind of try to channel people there on sundays or or, or just in general to kind of spread out the capacity because there's an infrastructure that was built for that particular activity. That's what that one was about. We're just looking for reactions to that. And that's a communications. Camp. I don't, I, well, <laughs> I, well, personally for birders, they're going to go where the birds are. So uh, you trying to promote a particular park is, you know, if there aren't birds there, they're not going to go there. So, you get you get a hot bird that you're looking for on your list. You're going where? Yeah, it's just, you're gonna go where the bird is. <laughs> sure. Just I just rewatched uh, the big year, so I yeah I get it. <laughs> a lot for, of um, for climbers with that one, um, that there's a there's a decent amount, a good amount of climbing on state park lands, but um, the reality is a lot of our climbing is limited on state park lands the the, res the resource potential versus resource open um is is very limited um compared to what it could be and i think that's the same with biking too I, I it, it like is that's, that's what i was saying it varies so over the state it, you know there are places where there are alternatives and places where there are very few um, mm -hmm. alternatives so that that local or that state park uh, options for for birding is it's irrelevant. We're going where the birds are. I get that for biking and climbing. Um, they're fairly limited. I mean, your your folks need to go where you know where the rocks are or where the the, the great the great off road trails are. Is what I'm hearing. And very very similar exactly. for paddling and access points. Got it. And and that's it. So um, that was that was again. I think. Uh, we just, I just wanted to get that. Any other thoughts on that particular one there? Um, and Heather, for the, for the riders, that's not as big an option either, is it? It's the same for anglers. They go where the trout streams are. I think anglers are well aware of where all their options to fish are. So I, I don't think you could be directing anybody to places they're not going already. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had, um, so we hit on, I'm, I'm jumped over to um, the, the right-hand column. We talked about buffers, but underneath that, I heard this come up earlier, but for now, this idea of permitting for specific uh, game lands, um, thoughts about that, that, you know, that, that whether it's a, a hunting permit or the one below it, some kind of lottery or something like that, is there just reactions to the, um, permits for specific game lands. I mean, they could be biking permits or they could be climbing permits. I mean, the idea of permits in general or by our horseback riding permits for that matter. If the idea of permits is to just make money, I don't think that's a problem. But if, if the permit is, well, you, that means you can only go such place, such and such a place. Mm -hmm. 
I, if you had a general permit that you, you that would be fine but to say a permit for specific areas no i don't like that okay yeah, but hold on, let me let me ask one point that i i don't think we're asking about permits for horseback riding or permits for climbing we're I just want to make sure we're we're just asking the question about for hunters to hunt on sunday would it be reasonable for them to have a permit or enter, enter some type of lottery system? I just want to make sure we're talking on the same page on this bullet. Yes. Personally, I'm fine with hunting on Sunday for me, so I don't feel like they need a permit, but it's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Hunters and anglers already get permits and, uh, you know, they're one of the, few user groups that that have to already so i don't think it should be you guys should add a, a, a additional permitting for, uh, agree with that. for hunters okay good to hear all running into a lot of hunters doing when you're doing your activities on saturdays during hunting season do you see a lot of hunters where you are i mean you got a lot of land out there so i don't know how often you run into we I will run into hunters from various times and um, you just try to minimize that I've never had a negative reaction okay um, and being in the game lands in this area for over 20 years so actually one time and it was when we stumbled onto private property so oh, it was okay. kind of understandable but <laughs> on yeah. the on as a general rule there's been very little conflict and we try to I think everybody tries to be respectful. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, angler interaction with hunters, the most common interactions I hear are uh, during bear season with uh, uh, bear hunters with dogs. Um, they're typically parked roadside. They spend a lot of time roadside. They're using the same access points that anglers do. And, uh, uh, I have heard that that is quite off-putting for a, for a lot of anglers. Um, so, but uh, the other types of hunting, I, I don't hear of any conflicts. What's the off-putting part? Yeah. Uh, well, um, there's usually a, a lot of vehicles, a lot of folks there, a lot of guns, a lot of dogs. Uh, there's there's also uh, you know, and this is just from what I hear. There's there's beer involved too and drinking and it, it's a it's a very different sort of uh, outdoor recreation I think than uh, most of us uh, you know are, are maybe used to and I know for most anglers when uh, when they see groups of bear hunters they're gonna go somewhere else um, it's uh, was that Mike. Yeah. yeah, this is Mike Mahalas. Yeah, yeah. Now, Mike, I just want to agree with you as far as the birding side uh, with the bear hunters. I was going to bring that up too. That's the only, the only hunters we really come in contact with in, in a regular basis is the bear hunters, and it's because of the dogs. Um, and that is a problem when when you're birding. And so the only, th that's the only issue I really have with hunters directly. Otherwise, it's, we don't really have much problems as far as direct, directly coming in contact with hunters. Got it. Um, jumping down, um, one, one of our things that came up was um, on that bullet four on the right side. We talked about Sunday uh, archery only maybe or uh, shotgun hunting. Uh, those were some options that did come up about um, that uh, as, as an alternative that we looked at. Any, any reactions to, to, to from, and, and generally speaking, the question was really, does this, does this, you know, what the pros and cons of that and just getting reactions from this user group about that option. Could you restate that? Archery only or shotgun only on Sunday. Oh, oh okay. Just for me, that's yeah. really not an issue. I mean, I can see for the hunting community, for the more challenging hunting styles, to have a day that kind of catered to them. But 
I, I don't have many conflicts with hunters, so fine. I have not encountered the dog hunters as they were just talking about, but I could definitely see Sunday or no Sunday where that would be um, a little unruly near designated trails for anyone. Uh, imagine a pack of dogs chasing a an animal running through a designated trail with a biker on it or a horse would just run um, yeah. or, or a family walking with kids and a big pack of dogs runs through. I can't I've never encountered that and I can't imagine that. Sure. That's just my thought on that. I, that sounds like a disaster to me. <laughs> near a designated trail. Anywhere else, you know, we have tons of land, but to do that near a highly used designated trail is seems a little odd to me. It's it's a very different sport for sure. My two we, cents on that. Yeah. Um so no, no, no opinions one way or the other that archery only or anything makes any issues for the horseback riders, Heather, any, any of the, this reaction to that bullet? None? No, um, archery, shotgun, it's more so the, the movement uh, as far as horseback riders, the movement in the area and conflict, user conflict would be the two. Okay. Um, okay, and then, you know, we did talk about this idea of, um, you know, we said we don't want to restrict user groups and we were pretty clear about that earlier everybody kind of weighed in that no we don't want to take away uh, a public access ride and i heard that across the groups i think um but react to that bullet about for hunting only picking select areas or lands to hunt on the idea of maybe um having some areas that we go hey for sundays um we, we would have these selected game lands or areas um, only for Sunday versus nothing. I mean, you know, just reactions to that concept. Versus nothing for who? Hunters. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have nothing now. I mean, we're talking about status quo. Unless you're hunting private land, you're not hunting on Sunday. And so now in game land, Maybe this this option was about selected game lands being on the menu for hunting. Maybe not all. Have has any hunting group chimed in on what game lands would be appropriate or would be meaningful for them to have open or more meaningful than others? Um I think that um, clearly out west, it's a it's a different conversation again. I keep we keep saying that, but um, yeah, they've chimed in about the idea that um, about having maybe some dedicated hunting lands, um, the idea of um, select uh, hunting uh, on game lands would be um, was an option that we got great you know varied reaction to. Um, it made our list. Uh, you know, obviously everybody's saying, gosh, it's, you know, is that more complicated rule wise? There was a bunch of criteria that popped up around it, but in general, it was one of those viable options that came forward with, you know, varying degrees of support from hunt, non-hunt uh, in, in, in the listening sessions. So this would be, hey, uh, in certain areas, again, this may not be applicable West, but you look East particularly or Central, you might just say, there's a lot of people, there are small lands, there are a lot of people on them. And for safety's sake, we, some people were saying maybe there's select lands that we could put on play and go, well, really, there's nobody else using these lands. So what's the big deal? That was kind of the idea behind it, really, to kind of summarize it. Thoughts on that? It seems to me it would make more sense for the managers of the game lands where there's more game in one area or something like that versus another user group yeah it's a, it is there is there enough game to, to to sustain you know that kind of pressure and we talked a lot about that in our listening sessions a lot of discussion about just how much pressure there was in fact one of the things we did point out john in the in the listening sessions we we heard a lot of discussion you know we we're looking at facts to make a decision about by adding sunday we would be adding more pressure on the game and kind of went through what that meant and uh and for some areas, those three day and 
there's some three day hunting opportunities in the state and those properties are only open for three days, you know, for hunting. And that has to do with game pressure. It didn't have to do with anything else. So right. those are the kind of options that we did discuss in our listening session. So, but from a, from a non-hunt uh, perspective, in this case, John, you're saying that it doesn't, it's really should just be about the science of the, of the game. For me as a user group. Yes. I don't, like I say, I have very little negative interactions with hunters. Ah, good. So. Uh, fine. Anybody else on that one? I just wanted to put that out there. The idea of select game land. It, it just sounds more to me like a hunter issue than a user issue. A user issue. It really is. And, and, and we don't, and, and they're not here. So <laughs> in general, I mean, some of us hunt, I get it, but we're, that's not the hat we're wearing today. Um, what, what, what does that mean? It's a, a hunter issue. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're more concerned about what their limits are as far as where they can hunt. Um, whereas the other users, are, are, I don't know, are you saying that other users cannot use those properties if they're designated hunters? Uh, yep. If not, then it's just a hunter's issue. Right. But so from, from your perspective, is, is that an okay option, you know, selecting specific game lands that essentially opens up hunting on Sundays, but doesn't restrict other uses, users? Um, well, I guess it depends on the game land, you know, like I said, if it's a, it's a particularly birdie one, they probably, a lot of people wouldn't like it, but, uh, well, I, the, yeah, the point there is exactly, it's that the, the, the devil's in the details here. So Brian stated one option, allow hunting on selected lands, but don't restrict other users. We talked about that earlier. It was sort of, you know. Um, or allow, and we talked about the idea of allow hunting only on selected game lands. And you know, that's one option that only hunters would be there on, on, on during hunting season, that it would be not open to others. And we got some reaction to that. Um, or the idea that, um, and then I think John's point to that would be if the issue was no, no restriction on other users, on users, but hunters could only hunt on specific ones, then it's really a hunter issue about how they react. The non-users uh, weren't impacted. If, and did I, did I summarize those three points the way I heard them correctly? John, is yeah. that? Yeah, I think so. And I think Brian, if that would, that could be a way to roll out this Sunday hunting is try it in a few areas before you implement it across the board or whatnot. But, um, you know, like I say, I have very little issues with, with the hunting. So. Yeah. Okay. And, and Heather, what, what is your comment there? Most logical solution there in the chat. Was that, that in response to this idea on select game lands? Uh, yes, it seems to me that that would be a logical, like first step, like a trial, you know, let's, let's open yeah. up the least used uh, area, the, the, the one with the least amount of trails with people walking and riding and biking and let's open those up and take a test run at it. I mean, it seems logical to kind of phase it in and see how it goes with a lower use area. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah, or, or it's a, those, those, those could be great options for like, as you said, a trial period. And that concept came up and, and I think Brian addressed it early on the idea that hey, maybe what we do is we try some of this stuff out, you know, and we gather data and we come back and go, hey, this is working and working here or it's not working there and, you know, adjust buffers or anything. So I would think that the idea of learning and making changes, that's a natural part of rulemaking. And it should, this could be an, an option, as you said, Heather, of let's trial some of that. Yeah, and you wouldn't have to have the complexity of the buffers and all of that if you opened up a lower use area. It would eliminate all the signage and buffers and questions, and it mm -hmm. would be a simpler solution, it seems like. Good. All right, well, deep breath in. Um, we've kind of hit those bullet points um, uh, around. Uh, I wanted to open up the floor and just say, as you look at the big picture, of Sunday hunting um, the, and specifically speak from the impact on if all of a sudden now we did, I said, well, okay, let's just, let's take the 
extreme end and say, let's open a Sunday hunting up all over the state and just say, we're going to do that. All right. I, again, I'm just picking that way on the other end. The other end is we don't do anything about it. I mean, we've got those ends, but if we were looking at that, how do you see the impacts from your Bruiser group perspective of kind of the considerations you'd like to be in a, any Sunday hunting opening, those, 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 you know, kind of pros and cons of, of uh, opening things up, any options you have. And I just want to give everybody a chance to hit the floor and get some ideas and be, you know, about Sunday hunting right now from a perspective of if it was all or some options or what do you think is viable from your user group perspective based on what you know sitting here at this meeting. So just if you don't mind, I'll start. John, you're, you're next on my camera, so I'll just pick you up beside me. Uh, just overall big picture thoughts about Sunday hunting options and any criteria that the commission should consider as it thinks about um, bringing Sunday hunting forward. I think from my perspective, I'm just looking at it with what I do on hunting, on hunting and Sundays. And the main thing is, and we've worked with Pisca Sorba on these projects before of working on an access point or a trail. And sometimes we'll, we're lucky, we'll round up 20, 25 volunteers. We'll hike three miles into an area, spend a day working on something and come out. And we always schedule those big days, especially when they're during hunting season, on times when there's not hunters in there to avoid conflict. The only thing I see, and it's not because we're worried about the hunters, it's because are, are, are affecting us or our safety or anything like that. It's that we're trying to minimize our impact on other users. And if there is Sunday, Sunday hunting, the only negative I see is these conflicts, these crossing of paths will be more likely to happen. Um, that's the only thing going through my head um, as far as this discussion. Yeah, it, it, it will put a lot more pressure on the relationships. I can yeah. see that. And it's, it's, it, that's clear that, that suddenly, as you said, during hunting season, there was that day of, you know, you didn't have to worry about stuff. You just did what you needed to do. You planned around it, you scheduled. And now there, there's going to be an expanded day that the hunters will be out there, which they would greatly appreciate because they're only getting that, you know, that one day for a lot of them during the season. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I can, I can see that there probably will be more path crossing and it's going to take all, it potentially could have greater tensions around that. But it may not, it, it that may be a, con, a illegitimate concern. I don't know, but that's the only thing I can think of as far as the recreation and work that we do outside of just going hiking or biking or something. Okay. And, and so for you right now, that issue of Sunday hunting, just there, it's really coming down to there probably be more user conflicts, but it, for you, it's not a safety issue. And yeah, I mean, for me, if, if there's going to be hunting on Sunday, it's always easier to rally a group on Saturday versus Sunday. So now <laughs> exactly. we'll just switch to Saturday, you know, so. And um, you're in a big group making a lot of noise. So chances are, you know, you're going to be okay anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I got it. That's, you know, I, I'm going to leave this one to the land managers personally. Uh, quick question for you though, is, is we consider those just uh, kind of closing that thought there. Uh, so we consider, or for the commissioners, are there some criteria for making this choice that you think they should consider? You know, uh, just ideas. These were brainstorms that we had, but are there any ideas that just jump out at you? Any, just like, hey, if, if you're the commissioner and you've got to make this choice, Sunday hunt or not Sunday hunt, I mean, what, what are some criteria that you think, you know, look, in making that decision, I think these are the fair values, criteria, things to fold into a decision that you make, whatever those are, doesn't matter. I know, I know from the climber perspective, we're really um, – in in with game lands really in the same boat it sounds like as as the peddlers where we did uh, our big thing is we just want to stay out of their way not for our safety um but for their enjoyment of the land right um and and we're to, so we try to do that no matter what 
it doesn't matter what day it is. Um, and and it, offering Sunday hunting or not doesn't really make a difference to us. We just want to stay out of hunt, a hunter's way for their sake. Um, that Not so much for ours. I mean, I, I, I don't think many climbers go out and feel threatened by, by hunters. I, I just don't, I don't see that happening out there. Um, so in, in that, um, and I, I'm not as tuned in to the kind of hunting community as I am, um, I guess, with like the paddling community. I know it's a pretty tight community. You can, you can talk to the paddling community and get the word out. Same thing with the climbing community, biking community, a uh, bit with the hiking community, but that's a little bit more spread. Um, I guess what would be nice is if they knew that all of these user groups and, and leaders of these user groups were were supportive of Sunday hunting. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe if they do pull up to a parking lot and there's four other uh, cars with with bike racks on, they'll say, oh yeah, there's the bikers that supported us for, for hunting this day. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't know how to get that word out. I don't know if that's possible with, with hunters or not if this does go through we're talking hypothetical here sure. but, um, I, I feel like that's something that could go a long way as far as user conflict goes is um, letting them know who supports them um, and 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 who supports kind of open recreation versus closed off recreation that's a good point and and it's really I think that um, so whatever that solution is the idea that that Open recreation to me is, is is a criteria that I'm hearing across the board here. Is that overall from the folks on this call? Um, and you got you got to a point that I was looking for is open access to public lands is a should be a principle that goes into thinking about how we move forward. The other one, early, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's what I was after. The other one I heard early, and I think Marilyn brought it up, and some others have reinforced it, which is the 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 idea that where we're not only going to have, um, you know, that, but we want to try to make it simple, easy, and not complex as a solution. So those to me were two ideas that I've heard. Are there any other kind of things that the commissioners ought to be thinking about as they, or you would recommend go into thinking, uh, framing choice? There's one thing I, I think that uh, birders have a little bit different perspective than some of the other folks, because they do worry about getting shot because birders tend to be stealthy and they don't wear bright colors. So um, that, that's one of the reasons that keeps them from birding on, on game lands during the hunting season, other than on Sundays. And, you know, it, we're not going to be noisy. We're going to be, we're going to be trying to be quiet, and sneak up on things. So uh, that, that's the one thing that I, I guess birders probably are more fearful than other users for that reason and so the orange thing for birders is a potential problem but if you said hey if you're going to be on game lands during hunting season you have to wear a blaze that would probably direct a lot of birders away from game lands is what i'm hearing well uh, it probably probably wouldn't stop them necessarily they probably would wear blaze but but they again they're going to be quiet they're not generally going to be shouting at each other walking down a trail a lot of them go birding singly or or in a pair you know and so they're 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 more stealthy than anybody else than the just hikers or or bikers or whatever more, more stealthy than hunters. So there, there's there's more yeah <laughs> well so they're that's the reason they're a little more fearful probably than a lot of other folks are okay thanks for that um any any um any others that going down in uh I've heard from John and Mike. Uh, Heather, any kind of reactions overall to just the stuff we put out there, some options, some th big, big picture thinking? Um, no, um, not really. I, I heard Marilyn's comment about being stealthy. Um, we're a little stealthy when we're horse riding and we're on an animal that is the same color as a deer. So that uh, that does make it a little scary for us, but uh, honestly, in backcountry horsemen in North Carolina, I didn't have a single board member say that they were opposed or did not want the hunters in there on Sunday. Uh, so 
I, I mean, the horse riders are supportive, but we also don't want to be shot. <laughs> but we're still supportive. We want everybody to use their land. I think it's unfair that they have a short season and then to limit their number of days that they're available to get out in their season. I, I don't think that that's fair from their perspective at all. Okay. Yeah. And, and of all the proposals on that previous slide, just thinking of it from a hunting standpoint, and a user group standpoint, it, I mean, it seems to me like the weekend should definitely be available for hunters. And if you're going to pull a day, another day of the week would make more sense. But Okay, I like that. I like, thank you for getting back to that. I heard that earlier, the idea that if you were going to say, hey, we want a day for non, yeah, don't make it a weekend day. I mean, that's my take. Okay, super. Um, so... Uh, Real quick, Heather, what's your take on horseback riders wearing blaze orange? I think they definitely should. I'm on the animal and it is brown. Uh, if, if you do not have any more common sense than that to go into a game land where people are hunting and not wear orange, that's ridiculous. So, uh, and I don't, I don't hear anybody that is opposed to that during hunting season. I haven't. All right. Thank you. Does requiring blaze orange introduce any kind of liability issues or concerns? I mean, uh, no anglers I ever see ever wear blaze orange, even during hunting season. If you were to require that and there was an accident, would that remove some responsibility of the hunter for that accident? Because they could say that the, the, uh, the, the person involved wasn't wearing blaze orange. Mm. I'm not sure. That might be something we have to ask our legal counsel about. That's a good question. I, I mean, because I, I don't think, you know, I mean, I think in the event of an accident, regardless if there's blaze orange involved, the hunter is responsible, right? They should have properly identified their yeah. target, of course. Sure. So, you know, but I mean, if you, if you require it and there's going to be a lot of folks who won't wear it. I, I know most anglers, even though they should, uh, won't wear blaze orange. So uh, they, I, I think if you do introduce these, um, you know, introduce the Sunday, which which I'm in favor of, and Child Unlimited is, you know, has no issue with. Uh, I don't know if you should put other requirements on all the other user groups to accommodate it. A uh, question I would have, um, Mike, would be, um, would they, could they, would they, I understand why you're in the water, kind of like the birders have the same issue. And by the way, the, the turkey hunters have the same issue. Um, I'm Stealth is part of what I'm doing. Wearing bright orange is not going to help me catch trout. Uh, so I guess my point is, would the idea of just in transit, you know, from my vehicle, you know, as I get to the stream, would that be an issue for trout hunters? I'm just asking. I don't think it would be an, you know, an issue. Um, I mean, it seems reasonable. Uh, you're, I, you are correct that on stream, I don't think most anglers would want to wear blaze orange. We do want to be stealthy as well. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I just go back to that, uh, you know, that concern about shifting responsibility. I, I think all the responsibility should be on the hunter to identify their target properly, regardless of, of what they're wearing. Got it. Yeah. So, so the key is if you open Sunday, don't shift responsibility to the other user groups for the issue. You know, it, it, you're, you're saying, leave it on, leave it on hunters. Right. As it is now. Yeah, it is. You know, it's funny because the responsible hunters absolutely spoke up and said, I would never hunt near a trail. I don't even understand. This is not a responsible hunter that would be near a trail hunting, you know? And, and so to me, we heard from those responsible hunters and they're perplexed about well, what are, what's the issue? They don't see some, I think some of the behaviors that we've heard about here um, that cause some consternation in the non-hunting groups that do see some of that, you know, whether it's, you, you know, the, the, the drinking and hunting or whatever, you know, those, those, those stories are. So, but I, so I got that piece, Mike, um, anything else decision wise, you know, don't shift responsibility. I got that. Any other criteria or ideas or options? 
that that just occur from from the Trump perspective? No, I don't think so. I mean, really, I I, uh, I don't think it should be complicated. I don't think it should be overly restricted. Uh, I do agree with earlier comments about potentially phasing it in, right? Just to make sure there's no issues that uh, you know we didn't imagine, right? But uh, no, I mean, aside from that, I you know I'm, I support support allowing equal recreation. Got it. I'm hearing that across the board. So um, coming around, Tom, I want to go over to the Sorba folks. Just give you a chance to kind of weigh in on up oh, muting. <laughs> oh, there you go. Sorry. Here. There you go. Now, I think I think Mike and John, Heather, all of them have, have really um, you know stated the, the you know a position that uh, that I know our board supports. I uh, only had that earlier question because I did have one board member who was uh, a little concerned, particularly about um, dogs, uh, and you talked about that earlier. So, uh, no, I, I, I think this has all all been very um, uh, helpful, and and I think we're moving in the right direction. We, we did hear a lot about, uh, certainly in the surveys, um, and some in the listing sessions, but mainly in the surveys, we heard a lot about dogs and, and their impact. And for the for most of the people, um, kind of like Heather, that live adjacent to game lands, um, you know, one of their big issues was, I don't want Sunday hunting because I need a day of rest from dogs running over my property all the time during hunting season. And that was, that was pretty much the big issue was the private landowners that were or that lived adjacent pretty close to the game lands and just having those trucks up and down the street all day some of that noise and and stuff going on there so we did hear a, a bit about dogs and, and dog hunting um as and a i've never met a mountain biker who has been you know has an anecdote a story about a confrontation or an encounter with dogs but it's just uh, it, it came up, and yeah. I guess what if kind of uh, concern. Yeah. So so again, no 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 issues um, in in from your membership, or at least what you've heard in the. Yeah. No, I don't believe so. Okay. Any uh, issues as as we talk through this? You know, you're you if you were sitting here talking to the commissioners right now and saying, look, you're you're sitting down to consider these these kinds of choices are there some kind of advice pieces that you would offer up to say make sure you consider this or keep this in mind as you deliberate um could i ask um on that uh once you if you move forward and you end up opening up sunday hunting um would there be the resources to police and patrol that from the wildlife perspective um, you know, here at URA, we don't see rangers on the weekend. And I would hate to be in the woods and have an issue or a confrontation with a hunter and not be able to get any assistance, uh, legal-wise, from the Wildlife Commission. Yeah, Heather, that's a, that's a good question and one we heard a little bit about during the, the public meetings. And our law enforcement officers work on Sunday as it is. So it really won't be a redeployment or doubling of effort. It will be a redistribution of whether effort is spent if and when issues arise or if hotspots pop up, then you know, will a detail be needed at Game Land X on a given Sunday to see what's going on? Yes. Does that mean we're gonna need more people or more resources? Not gonna lie, we need more as it is. I, I will I'll admit that, but this would just require them to be deployed differently. Okay, um, and, and I ask that because I personally have ridden on a designated trail and found a pile of corn poured out in the middle of the trail. And then I'm looking around going, I know there's a hunter somewhere with a gun aimed at me. And my mule actually tried to eat the corn and it was on a marked designated trail. And so I'm like, what do I do? Yeah. I knew that was illegal to hunt over corn, but I didn't really have a clue what to do, where to go, or who to call at that exact point of then just get out of there. Yeah, hunt over corn on a trail. Yeah. Yeah. 
Lovely. Um, uh, so any, we're, we're kind of coming into a place where what I'd like to do is if we could pivot to something that I think is a, a natural um, uh, uh, wrap up for us. And one of the big options clearly was, boy, and, and it was, I think it was a softball, but it was one of these options that how about more game lands too? I mean, just overall more game lands would be nice. And for those game lands to have um, more amenities, we talked about whether it's parking or, you know, better trail maintenance or better signage or those kinds of things. And that was one of the things where we asked both the hunters and non hunters in the survey, that, that idea of, this is a resource we all agree about that, that we, we, we would like more of and we'd like it better maintained and we'd like a lot of things. And, and like you said, Heather, we'd like maybe more law enforcement presence. And there were a lot of things that, that folks came up with. Um, and one of, the, one of the concepts that came up as we were doing that was the idea of, well, you know, as we think about this, um, we have a lot of users out on the and the data is thus, um, and Brian, I'm gonna summarize, so it won't be exact numbers, but out of the game lands that the state has purchased, um, 600,000 acres, um, about 89% of that funding came from what I'll call general funds. It's a grant process that the state has. So the taxpayers paid for those lands. Your, your, your users paid for that through other means. They didn't have a direct tax on them. Anglers pay into a fund hunters pay into a fund. And those monies then, uh, those of you, you may or may not know, but they're, they're matched federally through formulas and there are national trust funds that come back to the state of North Carolina. And so the ongoing maintenance of those 600,000 acres plus, um, by and large is paid for by the, the hunters themselves and the anglers, boaters that are paying into these user funds. But the hunter's point is, we're paying to maintain these properties anyway. It's our dollars that go toward whatever is here in terms of the maintenance piece. So they paid a percent to get them, a small percent, but they're paying a fairly large percent of sustaining and maintaining those properties and, and trails and parking, et cetera. So their question was really, and the question really came up is this willingness to pay discussion of, are there other groups that say, you know, we could have better riding trails, if we could have better biking trails, if we could have better parking, if there are uh, more enforcement, is there a willingness to pay in the user communities of some kind of approach to that? And so what I'd like to take our remaining 10 minutes and just have that conversation, if we could, on an overall willingness to pay to access that. Now, we know, for example, horseback riders are, you're, you're required to purchase a $15 um, game lands just to write on certain game lands. Heather, you're aware of that. And, and uh, so to some extent, the horseback riders are doing that now, but bikers aren't um, and, and, you know, paddlers aren't and et cetera. So the question would be, um, and we kind of touched on it earlier, what about kind of a, uh, just that overall uh, permit or thing that said, hey, if you're, if you're on game lands, um, you know, here's a, a game land permit that you can use to go to any game land or, or whatever the decision point is, but that folks would be contributing to that. So I want, just wanted to open with a big idea about that, just kind of reactions, because we did test that in the, in the listening sessions. Well, I, can I don't in think here. that would be a problem. But, uh, oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, this is Marilyn. I, I don't think birders would have a problem with that at all uh, to, to require a, a fee to bird on game lands. I don't think that would be a problem for them. They, I did have one question though. You were talking about designating more game lands. Does that mean trying to purchase more land or does that mean taking land that already exists and designating it a game land? No, no. I, I think from the idea there that came in the survey was more of acquiring either a acquiring more, which is going to be tougher and or leasing more because a lot of the game lands are in fact leased from partners like Forest Service or you know Duke, Duke uh, Energy and those folks. So the, the question was really, do, do the citizens of North Carolina want more game lands? And obviously then that would mean, yeah, we'd be more and better is what we would like, what seemed to be the answer that we got in our 31,000 response survey. So if that's the case, we, we naturally led to, yeah, and 
would we have a funding source for that? How would we do that? Because right now we've got a limited source to maintain generally the, the fees from, from the hunting license and, and the match from the federal government for that. So that, that's really what yeah, we that, that, Okay. So, well, the one question I have about is that the user fee then is, is that applied to anybody who wants to go out in the forest? Uh, you know, because anybody who wants to go into the Pisgah forest has to have a, has to have a permit, because that would be really tough. To... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here really quick. This, this idea and this concept would, would really be applied, you can think of it as what state-owned game lands or properties that don't require an additional fee. Um, you know, we're, we're still obviously just kicking this idea around and seeing what it could look like, what what the support is for this idea and really the focus is that kind of on our state-owned game lands or those that we more more actively manage okay so it doesn't apply to national forests then it, 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 in all likelihood it would not apply to national forests correct so the the issue here then is just a general we, we, we pulled this in the, in the um, we, we got this in the survey, people responded. We pulled it in our listening sessions. You know, we used the polling devices to, to see that. And there was a like really high 98% folks saying absolutely willingness to pay. Right now the hunters are basically paying for what is there. Would others be willing to contribute? And uh, so that was kind of a next piece to say, we want more, we want better. Uh, whatever that means, war and better game lands, um, then, then whether it's the trails or the access points or signage or whatever, marking the trails or it was really, okay, well, would folks that are not hunters be willing to contribute toward that? So that was the kind of the question that got us there. Um, so just thoughts on, let's just say if it was 15 bucks a year as a kind of, a, we'll just call it for the state game lands. We weren't talking the federal piece, but just say for those other state game lands, whether it's a simple permit or, you know, something you can get online or whatever. Thoughts on that? I mean, how does that impact from a climber's perspective or anglers or bikers, Tom or John? What, I mean, you know, what, what do you think? From, from a trout angler perspective, uh, I, I would have to ask around. This is not something I've asked, you know, our membership about. I mean, personally, I wouldn't have a problem with it. And of course, I'd love to see more money go into trail maintenance and development of those lands. Absolutely. And I think most anglers would be um, I don't know if licensed angler fees right now go into game lands or not. I'm not, I'm not sure if they do. Yeah. I don't know if Dingle Johnson money from the excise tax, I don't know if that goes into game lands or not. So anglers may already be paying in quite a bit, but I'm not sure. They so are. I, I'd have to look into that before I could give you I, a I just response. respond to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're correct. And um, yeah, fishing license, hunting license, those are already accounted for in terms of a game land access um, permit, if you will, or game land license. Those are already included. Yeah, so anglers and hunters would be already essentially are, are, are part of that match that, that, that we're getting back. Mike is coming from, from both to, to, to do what is being done right now. Okay, great. So, so there's two license groups, and boaters to some extent have some impact on on that as well in terms of match, et cetera, Brian, as I, as I recall. So, but, so it's really looking at, um, um, you know, kind of Tom, I mean, whether it's bikers or climbers or paddlers or whatever, just general thoughts about that. That's what we're looking at. Can I jump in here? Oh, please. Um, I've definitely thought a lot about this here at Green River Access Fund. We pay for our own private access. Um, we do a ton of work on access points and trails. And, uh, and this is specifically to the Green River. Um, for me, for me, before I would support a fee, the there would have to be a re envision of the mission statement for what the game lands does. Um, I understand, um, you know, right now hunters and fishermen pay for a fee to create successional habitat, plant crops operate fish hatcheries, these kind of things that support that. Um, 
just putting money into the system without some kind of guarantee of what we're going to get out of it. I'm not at all comfortable with that. Um, but if there was a re of this, of the statement, um, if there was, um, more money allocated towards access points, um, you know, if we could get some kind of state maintained trails and, and things like that in there, um, it's certainly something that I would be open to. Um, but sitting here right now, I'm a long way from, from that. That's, um, I, I just want to, you know, uh, add that, uh, you know, with the Sorba, we are not adverse to, you know, the pay to play. However, uh, very much is along John's lines. Um, uh, they want to make sure that uh, the money would go into the trail system, uh, the maintenance of the trail system specifically, uh, and uh, not into a general fund. That's that's what I've heard over 20 years uh, with these discussions. So that we're not against it. You know that that would be. And there are places where we certainly do pay in state parks, and there are county parks that require funds. So uh, it it's not unheard of. But that's usually the the caveat. Yeah, and, and I'm fully open. Our, oh, I'm sorry. In our, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry, sorry, John. In our listening sessions, just for for Tom and John uh, perspective, the um, we heard that loud and clear that this wasn't a um, add on. You know, I, I'm paying in so there could be more food plots. You know, for deer or whatever. It was yeah. really expanding the the vision of what. Well, yeah, yeah. We're, we're there's a multi user participation and a broader thinking about what would go along with that. So. To your point, we heard that loud and clear in the listening sessions that it wasn't just we're putting money in over here. It was, yeah, and we wanted we wanted better and we wanted more and we wanted, you know, whether it was trails and signage and parking and those kinds of maintenance things, we'd like to see that going into that. And uh, so that's that the points you're making, we did hear in the listening sessions loud and clear. Yeah. And in, in that case, you know, uh, I think our user group will be open to something like that. There's obviously the problems, you know, it, any get, given day on the green, like seven days a week, there's a group coming from Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, and making sure that those out of state people have that. I know that that river and that community is a big economic driver for the town of Saluda, for the County itself. Um, there's a lot to consider in yep. that approach. Yes. And, uh, you know, personally, I would love to see that money come from, I would gladly pay a higher tax. I think that people getting outside access to public lands is incredibly important. I mean, look at us, we're on a Zoom call right now. Yeah. And we should all be out in the woods doing something. Um, so, you know, that's a complicated issue. And certainly our group is not opposed to that, um, but it's definitely something that we would have to work on before we jump behind it. Not a problem. Um, and just kind of tossing it over, um, Marilyn, any, any thoughts on that from the birder perspective? Well, again, I don't think birders have anything uh, against paying a fee to get on to uh, specific lands. Uh, but again, I, I agree that it, the money that's used uh, would be directed to something that would benefit them as well as others. Um, and I think personally that the, the more that people like birders or hikers or wherever, have access to those kinds of properties. They, it's also the more likely they're willing to donate land or money or whatever to purchase more. So I think that's an incentive for them as well. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a way to engage uh, more people. Um, quick question. One of the concepts that came up as we were working through uh, the thing was the idea, and this came from user groups, was the idea that um, what if uh, we just said, hey, either buy a quote hunt or fish license might be the, the best way to do that. And the main reason for that was, again, was that you get this federal match, which we don't get out of any other pot. And so we basically get almost the three for one for every, so you put 15 bucks into a hunting license if you're a birder or a biker or whatever, um, that money, then you know you'd have a checkup that said I'm a biker, so we could you know kind of target it to sort you know these are biker interests or paddling interests or hiking or climbing interests. But the net would be at the end of the day, we could get almost a three for one match coming back out of the federal pot. So we talked about that idea. I just wanted to test that. Does that resonate? I mean, could you see your folks going? If I buy a hunting license, we get at this federal. 
catch that we don't get if I just buy a permit? Would that be politically not good? Or I'm just, we're just testing the reaction to that. That seems like a logical solution to me. Uh, you know, uh, I would want that to go along with a re-envisioning of what that hunter pass gets you. But um, that seems like a streamlined way to actually make it happen if it could ever happen. Yeah, and, and we, the, the key yeah. we got with that, John, was from the folks in, the, in this, again, in the listing sections was, yeah, as long as I can check off a box that says, I'm a birder, I'm a paddler, I'm a biker, so that we knew that these groups are contributing and there should be some dollars going toward the, the needs of those groups as well. That was what we heard. So, well, I, yeah, I don't think uh, birders in general have a, a big uh, anything against hunting. In fact, a lot of them buy Ducks Unlimited, go into, uh, contribute to Ducks Unlimited. So um, I don't think that would be an issue. The only question I had was, I mean, does, is this a federal match, did you say? Yes. Did, would they catch on to the fact that a lot of these people aren't hunters? It doesn't matter. There's just specific rules that the feds have about how they do match. It's a complicated topic, okay. but the answer is a lot of states have figured this out already in other ways. Oh, okay. All right. John, uh, any, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, yeah, uh, I just wanted to say from um, climb, climber's perspective, I have not um, touched base yet with board or any members or asked them about user fees. Um, I, I do know that if if the if it were was a user fee on like a national forest property, I think that would not be seen as um, seen as something something good. But I think if it was specific to a specific game land or um, like the Green River game lands or something like that, and there was a user fee there that had uh, that was really clear about the messaging of what what those funds were going to, for example there was a project that was going to expand the game lands by, you know, X amount of thousands of acres. And that's why we're doing this permit process. I, I think that might be more um, shared. I, I'm, I'm not, not quite sure about the, um, the permit for, you know, for people to get a hunting fishing license and then just check the box. Cause I, I know that that, um, I'm not sure what the cost is there. You know, I, I think if, if the permit was pretty inexpensive on an annual basis, then that would be um, worthwhile. I, I can speak, give you an example of a game land um, in Virginia, um, Hidden Valley. We, the Carolina Climbers Coalition purchased um, access to this climbing area, which is also part of it is owned by the Virginia game lands. And in order to access that, our um, any climber that goes there needs to, to either buy, I think it's a $3 day, uh, day pass or a $17 annual pass. Um, and they're used to that, that's part of the, the permit process. And that was, um, even though we as climbers own part of the land there, um, they're accessing game lands. So that, that's just an example of where we already do that, that's already in place. Um, yeah, and, and, and Mike, just here and here, though, message, what are dollars going for, and how are they being used, and why? And I think that that's an important piece, Mike. If I'm hearing you right, it's the messaging. Yes. And just to give you some really high level thoughts, you asked you about cost. You know, historically, a game man license is fifteen dollars, and a basic hunting license right now is say twenty five dollars. So. That's kind of an annual cost of, of entry we're kicking around. Yeah, this isn't big. It's 15 to 25, somewhere in that. If, if you were to match what's going on right now, I, uh, the uh, fishing licenses, are, as we said, that's already covering part of that. Hunting does. It was just really, would that work? So, um, and then Heather, your point, you know, what you, you got non-residents and you've got those kind of issues and kind of get that. And so there's, there would be a lot to work out clearly, but that, that was just more of a idea that, well, if, if we want to, um, if we want more and better, and that's what we, this drove out of the survey, the survey, I mean, 31,000 people told us they wanted more and better and they wanted these kind of amenities and they wanted more trails, better parking, better signage, better demarcated stuff. Um, you know, just 
infrastructure, the, the horseback riders, Heather, for example, they wanted a little more infrastructure in some areas where, you know, easy to pull their trailer in or whatever. I mean, there was just a lot of things that people said this would be, this is the future of North Carolina, whether it's trails or whatever. And it was really led to, well, what about a willingness to pay piece? It, you know, and that, that's really what launched that discussion more than anything else. Yeah. I, I think it's a super fair question. I know that through some of our events that we've partnered with, you know, we've made significant donations gladly to NC Wildlife. Um, but when we've made those donations, we've sort of put a caveat, can we get an access point here? Or can we just guarantee that this is gonna be public? Right. And so if that goes along with it, I think it can definitely be worked, worked out. Yeah, John, and I, I, all I can tell you is everything we heard said, yeah, this is dollars that expands the broad utilization of the game lands that we have. As you said, it's not about, you know, it's, it's now we have a broader user group because right now anything, you know, the, the, if you have one, well, really in this case, two user groups, it's sort of everybody else is using it. That's great. But the maintenance fees, you know, they're, they're pretty limited. If you had more, but you would expect a, a broader distribution of the kind of investments that would be made with those monies. And I think that's, that's clear. It's got to be that way. All the horse people that I have talked to are totally willing to pay as well. I've not heard anyone say that they are opposed to putting money into improving trails, parking, et cetera. I just wondered how you would facilitate it, parking pass, hunting license. That was my only question, but they definitely are willing to pay from everything I've heard. Absolutely. And, and we already have an online system that we could quickly piggyback off of for out of state and others as well. But yes, I heard the same thing in the listening sessions directly from your, your compatriots on horseback. So it seemed that there was a, certainly a willingness. And as you said, in, in some places in the state, you're doing that right now. You're already paying 15 bucks for access to certain game lines. So those are the big things that we had. Um, I just wanted to give a, uh, we've gone over a little, but what that's done is our group has been smaller. And what that's done is it's really necessity. We do not have to have an afternoon session. So kind of giving you back some time this afternoon for those that were here. Um, we will dial in at one just to make sure anybody who wasn't here in the morning would be there uh, and have an opportunity. So we will dial back up at one o'clock or we'll leave the session open. You can drop back in if you choose. Um, but that's what kind of where we were looking to cover. And we covered that ground pretty quickly this morning uh, with the group. Um, just wanted to get, give everybody a chance for closing thoughts and to let you know that at one o'clock, we'll still be here. And if you come back and you've had some chance to think, talk to membership, noodle some of the things we've talked about and have some ideas, et cetera. We'd love to, uh, we'll be online at one to, you know, till the last person wants to come in and give us some ideas or thoughts. So I did want to make that offer, but I think we've covered the ground that we were hoping to cover today. Brian, any, any big ideas there? Um, just wasn't sure if we wanted to, then maybe, we, maybe we did touch on this, but you know, we heard a lot about select game lands and that might be a logical place to start. I wasn't sure, if, I mean, did we hear it that this might be those locations that that don't have a lot of other users? So I'm just thinking about criteria. So maybe a we game land that has an established horseback riding parking lot or horseback riding trail, you know, maybe that's not the place to start. I'm, I'm making some assumptions and inferring some some information that I heard, uh, I, I don't really want to do that, but um, I'm, I'm just not sure, is that what we're thinking in terms of these select game lands and this criteria we use to select them, more looking at either infrastructure that's in place to support other users or just data we have, observational data we know, um, data from NC State University that shows us where some of these users are. Are you suggesting we use that to kind of drive the criteria and the location decisions about if select game lands are chosen? I don't want to hang up before I make sure I'm clear on that. What I heard, Brian, and then let the group correct me, um, what I heard is there are probably some places where, certainly if you were thinking about trialing stuff, where it's clear that there's a lot of hunting going on there those would be great places for a trial. And I heard that a little bit earlier, um, but I also heard 
that overall this group was not for necessarily restricting anything in the West um, in terms of utilization. Um, and so, you know, that's where we got to, but I did hear the criteria you put forward that, you know, if, if it was an issue that if you were gonna pilot, find those places where there's a lot of hunting and maybe not as much other utilization, but I think the group was generally against any kind of restrictions is what I heard. So let's go back though to, to the group and, and reach closure on that topic. Well, I, I would agree with that. I think that, that generally speaking, I don't want any particular area cut off altogether. You don't want one particular area cut off for or can you just yeah expand on that a little bit? No, what I'm saying is, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why I don't see it be necessary to cut off any public lands to any user group. Um, you can have limitations, but I don't see any why you'd say no. These that or this, this or that particular user group cannot use it. And you're you're including hunters in that user group. Yes. I'm sorry. You're including hunters in that user group? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Just wanted, just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear anything that was stated by anybody on the call that would restrict anybody's access to game lands, is what I'm trying to say. I, I think I heard that, that those restrictions. Now, if you were tr going to select and you were going to pilot, there was the idea put forward that I heard that perhaps then you would target an area that that is largely hunting and you know maybe roll it out there but I didn't hear that also we would restrict anybody else's right to use that property so that's what I heard from this group consistently through the call yeah I think if you rolled it out in an area that was primarily used for hunting there wasn't a lot of other recreation going on there see how it works with the private landowners around there and all that before you throw in all the other user groups with it, it could be a good way to make it happen. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been lucky enough to work with national parks and national forests and other agencies on various projects and NC wildlife. They do a lot of stuff with a little, super, I like the rugged and wild nature of the game lands. Um, too much development out in the woods increases the bureaucracy around it, the enforcement and things like that. So when we talk about this, you know, it's just, uh, things are pretty good the way they are. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with, with hunting and whatnot and want to make the game land sustainable and the whole organization, but, uh, it's just really awesome the way they are right now. It's, like I'm super appreciative they didn't shut down access to the game lands through all of this, I, through all the coronavirus thing. And I know that was not an easy decision. And so it's pretty dang good right now. So that's kind of how I want to, want to, want to end it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't, don't go too crazy with it. It's pretty good right now. So. Don't make it complicated. Yep. Anything else, Mike, you got anything from the climbers? I just want to echo what John said. <laughs> we, I feel like we've got a good in the game lands and um, I, I've never really understood this, the Sunday hunting. F felt like it was kind of an antiquated law and um, man, I would hate it if they limited climbing on a Sunday. I, I would just, that would, that would wipe us, you know, that, that would wipe us out, break our hearts. So That's my thoughts a hundred percent. Yeah. Mike, did, can I can I uh, ask you? Did you take the survey? Because I certainly read that as a climber. I wouldn't want anybody to limit me climbing anywhere. I, I re remember reading that comment boldly. So, <laughs> not yep. but <laughs> yeah, I did, we, and we shared it to the, the survey as well. So, yeah, um, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Good. Anything, Tom? Final thoughts? I'm just I'm wrapping here. I just want to make sure we got everybody's ideas on every topic that we 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 hope to set out to and. We'll, we'll be here at one. So if you guys want to break now, we can, we'll still be here. So, uh, but the, the lines are open and we are officially, I think at that point, uh, we'll be back on at one. I want to give people a chance to process. So if you can drop back in, great. If you can't, any final comments now would be great.
just a thank you and it's been yeah. it's been a pleasure working with you guys and Brian, good to work with you over the last last little bit too. But Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, same to you. Well, again, yeah. yeah, thank you. If uh, if uh, I I'll talk to some people probably here in the next couple of hours and report back. And if there's anything uh, uh, else to be added, um, I'll jump back on at, at, at one. If not, the line will be open. Vernon, uh, we'll turn the recording off here as soon as we wrap here. But the line will be open, and we're hoping you can come back. And you got some, you know, you've had some thinking time. Uh, offline just to go, hey, wait a minute, or you checked in. But if there's some things that we didn't hit, big ideas you want, we hope to see it one. We'll be here, and, and um, but I think we're close, but I, I want to give everybody a chance to think and come back. That was the plan. So I'm not rushing it. I just want to make sure that we, we do a good wrap up. So why don't we adjourn there? Brian, any closing thoughts before the one o'clock session? No, that's just it. And uh, if we see you again at one, great. If not, yeah, I definitely appreciate the input and the thoughts and helping us through this. Um, yeah, it's a big decision. And we appreciate your help in, in trying to get, to get there. And uh, as you think of things or ideas, um, you, you've got an email from Vern because you talked to him. Um, if you think of things now or over the next, you know, weeks that are coming up as we're moving toward this retreat or thoughts, or if you happen to talk to your member, some idea emerges or issue or concern or criteria, whatever, please, 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 please go ahead and email Vern so we can make sure we get that in our report. And we'll handle that however you want that handled. So, all right, we'll see you at one for those. What, what, can I, one, one question? When, when, is your, when do you have to make this final decision? Oh, we've got, Brian, your retreat is when? All right, so we're hoping to get that retreat done in July, but we'll then take another month or so to compile all data, come up with actual solutions and recommendations and pre present that to our commission in October. That's really when they make their decision on what rules to bring forward. Any rule that comes forward, you'll see again in January at a public hearing, but um, really our decision point is October. And Marilyn? Okay, present like yeah. preliminary input if you could get poll your folks talk to your folks the next week or two would be great okay all righty great because that i can fold that into the report that that Vern and i are preparing after these three focus groups and to make sure that when they they've got all the thinking from the focus groups that they can get so if there's time so we'll see y'all uh, do you have focus groups uh do you have focus groups uh, in the piedmont coastal area is that uh, specifically then Thursday. yeah okay yeah. all right just checking because <laughs> i'm sure they'll have a different opinion <laughs> yeah and, okay and great different i mean they'll be very different i think their issues with the smaller game lands will will show up as very different than where you've got these big huge yeah. properties that right. you have with the federal lands here so okay all right thank you thanks everybody really enjoyed it hopefully you can join us at one the the session will be up and open and uh we're turning off recording now. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I probably will not be here at one.